So I'm Robert Murphy. Let me uh, welcome you guys to the Mises Institute. I haven't had a chance to talk to you yet. I hope, as every people have been saying here, I hope you do appreciate that the thing about the Mises Institute that's sort of special is it's not merely that there are academics here who are accomplished scholars in their respective fields of expertise, uh, but if you go to most conferences that are populated with economists, if you look in the back section during a, the, a main lecture, people are either checking Facebook or they're dozing off, all right? And here, uh, that's not, it's not the case. The people are fairly good lecturers, uh, in particular, Judge Napolitano last night. I mean, I just go to his talks just to watch how does he give a public speech to see how does he just take control. Uh, so one thing he did, I'm just again pointing these things out, if you notice he, when he was going around the crowd with the microphone, Nobody's dozing off in that situation, are you, right? You're, you're wrapped with attention in case this crazy guy puts the microphone in front of my face. What am I going to say, right? And the other thing he did, you'll notice, he told each of you how you were going to die. Did you catch that? All right, he gave you two options. Now, the special thing, he didn't mention this, but as an incentive to take his special course here, at the end of the week, he tells you specifically whether you'll die in the public square or in prison, all right? So you, you, don't, you don't have to worry. Okay, what am I talking about today? It's the economics of the stateless society. So uh, one way of thinking about what is it that happens in, let's say, uh, applied, some people would call it extreme or radical libertarianism. Most of us here would just call it being consistent, right? Uh, or like saying, we believe in liberty for real. Uh, and so, and I, you know, this, this is the thing that happened, like my personal odyssey. I was a libertarian in high school at some point, and then I, some, yeah, I was reading Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams, and that got me in economics. I got a hold of Milton Friedman, all oh, this is great stuff. Then I got Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson, which, you know, was, oh, wow, this is, I love this stuff. And then he mentioned Ludwig von Mises in the beginning, like I think he dedicated it to him. And so I just kept reading, and then somehow I got a hold of Murray Rothbard's For a New Liberty, and I remember saying to my parents at the time, like, wow, this guy doesn't even want there to be taxes, ha ha. And I, and I was thinking, like, that's crazy, right? Like, yeah, I know there's got to be low taxes or maybe a flat tax, but come on, you, you know, the government has to be there to, to spend money on military and defense and police and whatnot. So uh, I think that's what happens with a lot of people is the reason they don't take, let's say, Rothbard's views to their logical conclusion. It's not for some principled reason. It's not because they say, you know, uh, I'm against a lot of tyranny, but a little tyranny is fine. Or, you know, I'm generally in favor of respecting people's rights, you know, except once in a while on Sundays. That what it is, is they just say this wouldn't work. A society that was based fully on respecting property rights where you really didn't initiate aggression, at least at an institutional level. Obviously, people are flawed and and, you know, depending on your worldview, you're going to think they're either evil or at least ca always capable of doing the evil thing. And so you're never going to get a society where everyone totally respects property rights forever. But the point is, if you endorse what we now think of as a political state, the existence of that, then you're saying institutionally there should be an agency that can initiate aggression, at least as those terms are normally defined, right? That, and that's, that's always the test to use. And I think other people have uh, presented this to you already so far this week to say what what libertarianism does, or at least in the in the tradition of Rothbard, is to say if if something is not acceptable or moral for an individual in the private sector to do, well then just because you win an election doesn't all of a sudden give you the right as a politician to do the same thing. Okay, so if you have a, a neighborhood, or just use the playground test, right? I have a son, and we was taking him to the playground, and there were sometimes kids there that had cool bikes or things, and if my son wanted to play with that stuff it wouldn't be enough for him to say, well, they're not using it. I mean, he, did, he tried that on me once. He said, they're not using it, right? It wouldn't hurt them any. They're over there on the swings. That kid's bike is just sitting there. What's the big deal? I'm not going to take it. I'm just going to ride it around. And I had to point out, I said, no, if it's, it's his. It's not yours. You got to get permission, right? And it wouldn't matter if there were 100 kids there and 80 of them voted that, yes, my son ought to be able to use the kid's bike because after all, the kid's not even using it right at that moment. That wouldn't matter, right? And if you suggested that to the parents, they would all be horrified at, th at that idea because they would get, no, that's the kid's property. And the kids should share, right? That's another tenet of good parenting, or at least parents who haven't read Ayn Rand probably, is to say <laughs> that, um, is to say, you know, you're supposed to share. So clearly, the, the, if my son had asked the kid and the kid's mom was standing right there, she would say, no, Jimmy, yeah, he's, you're not using it. Let him borrow the bike. But the point was, strictly speaking, it's the kid's property. And so that's logic extending through to the state. So what I'm going to do 
in this talk is just run through several topics to show different areas of application to try to get you to see how free market economic thinking could apply in these areas. Because again, just to come back to finish that train of thought, I think most people, it's not a principled endorsement of the existence of this institution that violates everyday notions of property rights, namely the state. The reason they think there has to be such a thing is just for practical consideration. Say, well, society wouldn't work without it. We'd get taken over by some foreign country or serial killers would run around or the mafia would take over, what have you. And so that's why they, they endorse this thing. So in an effort to push back against that mentality in this talk, I'll just run through uh, several main areas to get you to see how could these things flourish or these types of institutions work in the absence of a state. Okay, on this topic, let me just make a few distinctions before we get going. So one is the distinction between law versus legislation. Uh, it, it's just, it doesn't quite fit in with the rest of my talk, but I just, since I'm going over this stuff, I think it's important for you to hear this in case it doesn't come up later this week. So law is something that, if you, if you just mean like a, a regular uh, convention or a, a, a pattern that people adhere to, either out of custom or out of a, an inner sense of morality or because they fear some supernatural punishment. It doesn't really matter what the motivation is, but if it's rules that people in a society generally obey, law, and that defined that loosely, had to exist you know, for, for civilization to exist, right? You can't have a civilization without having some notion of law that people obey. But the modern notion of legislation, meaning legal rules, or what we might call statutes, that, are, that the, the human authorities promulgate and they can differ based on their, you know, I, I could say based on their whim, but that would be kind of loading the deck. Whatever, you know, they could carefully consider it and have parliamentary procedures and whatever. But the point is, the idea that human political officials can change what the law is, that is a more recent innovation. All right, and I'm, I'm not enough of a historian to tell you exactly when that change happened, but the point is, there was a long period of human history when everybody knew full well there were laws and you could be a criminal and the king's job or the tribal chief's job was, among other things, to punish lawbreakers, but that those same political authority figures did not think they had the authority to change what those laws were. They just, you know, either they didn't think about them, they just took them for granted, or they might have thought they were from God or what have you. But so, so make that, you know, make sure you understand that distinction. And so that's relevant in this, the broader picture when you wonder, well, gee, how could there be a legal code or legal system without state officials telling us what the law was? I'm just pointing out that, that that's a relatively recent innovation in uh, human affairs. And by the way, if, you, if you're familiar with Friedrich Hayek's book, Law, Legislation, and Liberty, you know, that's, it's not that Hayek was being redundant because he wanted to get a bigger word count in his book. He was saying those are distinct things. Okay. <laughs> Other passages from Hayek would lead you to believe he was trying to pad the word count, but not the title of that book. Okay, so uh, another important distinction is, is for-profit versus not for-profit. And uh, again, this is, let me just go ahead and the next, bring this next one up as well. And that ties right into this distinction between a, a narrowly conceived market versus the broader, let's call it civil society. And uh, again, here, don't get caught in the trap of if, if, someone's, if you're talking about some kind of particular thing that's a good element of a free society, or let's say of a good society, and then we're debating whether a free society would produce this thing or not, uh, don't get caught up in, in trying to think, oh yeah, there's got to be some profit-seeking business enterprise producing that thing as it maximizes shareholder value, or else we need the state to do it. Okay, don't fall into that dichotomy and that trap that in a free society where property rights are respected, there could be a whole range of not-for-profit institutions, civic associations, fraternal organizations, just what we'd call charities, philanthropic organizations, providing uh, you know, things that are people are falling through the cracks and being helped by these agencies or these institutions, even though it's not that some firm is maximizing shareholder value by producing that thing. All right? So again, just make sure you don't fall into that trap. What we're when we're contrasting a stateless society versus a free society, uh, or sorry, a stateless society versus one that has a state in it, it's, again, not the difference between profit versus not profit. Okay, a couple other things. 
if you're getting into an argument with somebody about this stuff, always remember the calculation problem, right? So if you're talking about some government institution, some agency that's doing such and such, and your critic is saying, oh, the free market couldn't possibly provide those services, you know, don't just fight on the terrain of, well, how is the market going to go ahead and provide that? Also look at the incentives facing the government institution and not merely standard stuff like saying, well, how can you trust the people in power, right? So you guys have already had Joe Salerno's lecture on uh, calculation, right? So it's the same thing there, like take the historical argument over socialism and what Mises brought to the table there and just expand it into all areas, right? So just to review historically, before Mises came along, the arguments over socialism, uh, people would say, hey, you can't trust any human with that much power. That's just, that's just dangerous. Look at what Lord Acton said. If you give a group of people the power to run the economy, they're going to abuse that power. They're going to put their enemies, you know, they're going to assign them to Siberia. They're going to starve them. They're not going to give them good posts in the universities and whatever. People can't be trusted with that much power. That's a perfectly fine objection, but if you have a very naive view of humanity, you could say, well, no, we'll have the right people in charge, okay? And then another objection was to say the, the incentives that if people, if you distribute, you know, you get the total amount produced, and then you distribute it to workers based not on their input or their merit, but based on family size or some other criteria, people aren't going to work as hard, right? Why, why, would, why would you show up to the factory and give it your all if the amount you're getting in consumption goods is not directly tied to your effort the way it is under capitalism. And that's also a valid objection against socialism, but they, the socialists came back and said, well, there's going to be a new socialist man. Yeah, people right now are like that greedy and selfish because that's they've been brought up in this horrible capitalist culture that's dog-eat-dog, dog, and you got to just be grasping and get everything for yourself because that's what capitalism teaches you you have to do to thrive under socialism, people will relax and just be happy to produce for their fellow man. So again, it was kind of hard to falsify that before the experiments. So Mises comes along and just says, I stipulate all that, that the planners are wonderful people who really want to help their subjects. I'll stipulate that the subjects are good comrades and will do whatever the central plan asks of them. Like, what, what do I do? What factory you want me to go to? What farm you want me to work on? And he said, still, there's this calculation problem that they just would not know even after the fact, whether the plan made good use of their resources, because there's no way to read, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, there's no way to reduce it to a common denominator. You can't really tell the cost of the resources you're using up if there aren't genuine market prices, all right? So there's no profit and loss test, all right? So that was what Mises brought to the argument over socialism as a whole system, and I'm saying you can do it even more piecemeal and just when it comes to some particular thing like a fire department or a police department or whatever, uh, soup kitchens, trash collection, whatever it is that the government agency is responsible for doing, you can again apply this calculation argument, right? And you're going to be successful, and that's why he's giving you the thumbs up. He's saying, don't worry, you're going to win the argument if you go that route. Okay, more generally, it's what has been called the Nirvana fallacy, and this is Demsitz, the guy who uh, came up with that term. The, the point is, typically what happens in these arguments is the critic will come up with all kinds of ways that the market approach to the, whatever the issue is you're debating is going to be suboptimal, right? And so, yeah, in general, you can certainly come up with hypothetical scenarios where the market is not going to be perfection, but the point is that's not what we're debating. We're not debating whether the market versus perfection is good or bad. We're debating market versus an involuntary parasitical state apparatus doing the same thing. And so just make sure you're doing an apples to apples comparison. Okay, uh, let me give you some real world examples of little mini stateless societies in operation. Now for all these things, I'm not going to show you, uh, you know, a, a bridge club in Somalia or something. What I'm going to be showing you is you know, that would be an, a, a voluntary organization in a stateless scenario. What, all this stuff is going to be embedded in a broader geographical region that's dominated by a state, obviously, admittedly so. But the point is, a lot of the intuition people have for why a stateless society wouldn't work doesn't really apply in these things. So what I'm trying to get you to see is this isn't all just pure science fiction in the heads of, you know, Rothbard and some of the other theorists. You can see this stuff approximated in the real world and it's just staring you in the face, but we just even sort of take it for granted. So one thing is just a modern hotel, especially one of the more luxurious ones 
that have you know many floors and all sorts of uh, facilities. N- notice that, and this is something I didn't even think of until fairly recently, it's not just that there's a lot of services at the hotel. Like if your toilet d- doesn't work in the hotel, they don't outsource that if it's a big enough hotel. They probably have plumbers that are on staff because they, you know, they don't want to have to wait for someone to show up and charge them overtime or whatever. They have people in-house doing that, right? So the hotel provides all sorts of amenities, you know, climate control, and there's all sorts of things. There's a fitness center and so on. Again, depending on how big it is, there might even be laundry and so on internally that they take care of, food and so forth. But even beyond that, there's also a distinction between public and private uh, regions, right? That the, the, if it's a, especially if it's a nice hotel, the lobby might be pretty luxurious and have a fountain and so on and, and seating where anybody can, can sit there. And even if you have people visiting you, they can kind of come and you can, you know, they can go to like to the restaurant that's right there or whatever. But then clearly there's areas of the hotel that are, are private in the sense that you have, only you're allowed to go in there because it's your room. Right. So even within the, the universe or the society formed by the hotel, you can see there's this distinction. All right. So, again, hearkening back to don't just assume if something is public that therefore, oh, it must be the state providing it. You can see that that distinction holds up and something is common every every day as a, as a hotel. OK, another example would be uh, an office park and these things. So what, what will happen is. A developer will come in, will buy this empty plot of land that might not be located near anything major, build up a bunch of office buildings, and then realize that it will be more conducive to productivity if the employees in all these uh, offices don't have to drive 10 miles to go to lunch or to go you know, drop their dry cleaning off or whatever. And so, again, depending on the economics of it and, with the, and the numbers – they might have more and more of the services that they might need to access during the day within the office park, okay? So there's like planning, if you will, within that, but the point is it's all private, and of course, they're guided by the profit and loss considerations, okay? There's parking, there's also, they, they would have security of some you know kind, so they wouldn't want people, if they stay late and they're walking to their car at two o'clock in the morning, that's not good for business for the, the tenants who are renting the office space. It's not good if their employees feel vulnerable at night so they're gonna it's in the interest of the people running the office uh, park to provide security make sure there's good lighting and stuff like that that there's maybe fences around or gates to make sure that random people from outside can't just come and go okay disney world that's another good one all right and so here if you sit back and think about it they do there's a lot of stuff that it's like a city it is a city right it's a kingdom, as it were, a, a magic kingdom, all right? Um, and so it's, I'm not, not endorsing monarchy, by the way. Um, and so, but again, think of it. I mean, there's, there, I went there with my dad one time and when I was a little kid, and, he, and we were driving around. Yeah, actually, I wasn't that little. But we were, we were going around, and he, and he was, this isn't a joke, he, he was marveling not at, you know, Space Mountain or like, oh, look, it's goofy. He was going, how do they move all these people around? Right? He was like talking about the, the monorail and stuff, and he was just amazed at like the logistics of it and how they move everybody around so so many people without there being long lines and stuff. You know what I mean? So if if you go to New York City and you were taking the subway, it would be a nightmare. You'd be miserable and hot. But at Disney World, they know they, they don't want their paying customers sitting around being miserable just trying to get to the ride. No, that you get you're miserable waiting to get on the ride, but moving around, it's it's pretty fast. Okay. So again. They have to do that, and it's all fairly uh, behind the scenes, right? So they do have security there, right? But yet you walk around feeling safe, even though there's lots of tourists there, a lot of people, you know, foreigners who maybe not, aren't that street savvy compared to some people that are from dangerous areas of New York, and yet they walk around probably with a lot of cash on them, and you don't hear about rampant uh, muggings at Disney World, okay? And again, but it's also you don't want to feel like you're in a police state, Right. You again, you want to feel like this is a magical place and you're walking around and it's all fun and games and you're in a movie. And so it's it takes a lot of effort on their part to produce that feeling or that environment. And again, this this is showing the benefits and, and how private property can produce this sort of outcome. And I, what I would say is I think a lot of people would see some of these examples. Right, well, let me just do the last one and then I'll make this point. And the last one is a cruise ship, all right? If you've never been on a cruise, you really don't know what you're missing. When I was, before I went on one, I was thinking, just get jammed with a bunch of people on this little thing and go, you know, go around the water. That's ridiculous. Why would you do that? I would want to go somewhere. But I was, I was wrong. Cruises are awesome. And, 
Um, and it's, it's amazing though, when you sit there, there are floating cities that produce all sorts of, they have, you know, medical services, the security, what have you. And again, it's, it's its own little city and it's largely, it's again, it's under the laws of some state somewhere, depending on where it is. I mean, there's periods where it's international waters, but the point is you can see that that's certainly not micromanaged. And if you get how the logic of this sort of environment works, you can see lessons for the, the broader world and realize that you can generalize this stuff. So I think some of the critics would say, yeah, sure, these things all work, but look at you, you're doing a selection bias there. These are all things where people with money can spend it. And so, yeah, we know rich people, if they have their own little enclave and keep all the riffraff away, they can certainly have a workable society. But come on, we need something that's a... But the point is, I would say part of the reason the general mass of humanity is poorer than the kind of people that take cruises all the time is because of statism, right? It's not that it's just a fact of nature that there's all these billions of people living near poverty, and then there's this, these pockets of people who are, you know, the rich upper class capitalist overlords. That's that's no, it's the result of uh, statism. And so that if you generalize this, so you, I guess the way the critic would interpret it, if, if our vision of the world is right and we had general freedom spread around the globe, and all these societies looking like this or that worked as well as these particular examples just started sprouting all over the place, they would say, well, sure, you just guys got lucky that everyone got rich all of a sudden. You know, and it was like, well, yeah, that's what a coincidence, freedom and prosperity. Okay, so let me just run through now some specific examples of goods or institutions that we might be concerned about or, or wonder how would these things be provided. And so one way to categorize this, this first set that I'm going to talk about is generic public goods. So things like lighthouses, even something as straightforward and, and commonplace as like jungle gyms or, you know, parks lo for local communities, and even something like fireworks. And so the, the economic definition of a public good, it has two components to it. It's uh, non-rivalrous in consumption and non-excludable, okay? And so the first one, non-rivalrous and consumption, means that if, if one person enjoys this thing, that doesn't detract from the ability of other people to enjoy from it or, or to enjoy it. So like something like fireworks, if you go out in your backyard and you look up and you see the fireworks that your local town government is shooting off, you're, you seeing that doesn't reduce the ability of somebody else to see it. Whereas if there's a, somebody produces a big birthday cake. If you eat one piece of it, that's one fewer piece, you know, to go around. Okay. So that's the, what the non-rivalrous and consumption means. And then the non-excludable, that's probably self-explanatory meaning that it's, it's difficult to keep certain people from, you know, given that you're going to produce it, it's kind of available to everybody. You can't pick and choose who gets to consume it or not. So there's something like, if you're going to build, if the, if the state builds uh, missile defense, right, like a thing that if, if an incoming Soviet warhead's coming, and this is back from, you know, the 1980s what, when I grew up, how they were, you'd think about this, like, oh, those Soviets, they're just itching to nuke us, and thank goodness Ronald Reagan's standing in, in the way. Um, and so if you build something that an incoming nuclear missile's coming in and some kind of defense that knocks that out, everybody in that region benefits from that. It's not that you can you know, have some people benefit and other people not. It's kind of like if you're knocking out incoming missiles, everyone, at least in that general vicinity, benefits. So that would be non-excludable. Now, in practice, mainstream economists apply the term public goods to things that those criteria do not apply to. And, and it's just, I guess they're being lazy. Like people will say roads are public goods. Well, no, you can easily keep people off of roads, right? And also it's not true for at least certain ranges if you get on the road, then it's more congested and it reduces the attractiveness of it to somebody else, right? So it really doesn't make sense to talk about roads being a public good, but in any event, that's what the definition is. So the ironic thing about these things, and these are supposed to be canonical examples of stuff that you need the state to provide because clearly, you know, how, how could private business, for-profit business provide a public good, right? That if you, you, if you do it and try to sell it to a few customers, well, then you can't stop everybody else from using it. That's the, that's the reason why public goods allegedly need government provision. But yet there's, each of these things have been provided by the private sector. Okay, the, um, if you're familiar with the Independent Institute, their, their logo is a lighthouse precisely for that reason. Because historically, I think Ronald Coase had a paper where he talked about how lighthouses were 
provided. So even there, you would think if you just thought about it for five minutes that, yeah, how could the free market produce lighthouses? Because once you build a thing and it's shooting the light out to tell ships, you know, here's where the, the coast is, be careful or whatever, that how could you just give the light to ships who had paid you in advance for that subscription service? How could you? But Ryland Coase has an article where he explains how actually this was privately provided. Uh, and so, and there's other examples too of, you know, again, Disney World has firework shows. And so it's not that clearly you need the state to provide this stuff. So, uh, and also I think, I think John Gotti, that one of the mob bosses in Long Island used to do fireworks every 4th of July. So see, it, it could be the mafia providing it. So <laughs> we don't need the state. Um, so with this stuff, and this kind of touches back on the, the calculation problem or the Nirvana fallacy, strictly speaking, I don't want you to go in unarmed. A sharp, ma- you know, mainstream economist is going to say, okay, you're right. Strictly speaking, the argument is not that a free market is totally incapable and will produce zero lighthouses and zero roads and zero fireworks shows. We're just saying they won't produce the optimal amount, right? That they'll produce some of it, but there's clearly, you know, a range where the marginal benefits to the consumers would exceed the marginal cost of the supplier, but yet they won't produce up to that point because they can't get the revenue from their customers because it's not excludable. And so there's lots of free riders, blah, blah, blah. Again, yeah, you can draw curves on a blackboard and denote that. But again, it doesn't follow. Therefore, if the state is in charge of doing this, they will produce the Pareto optimal amount either. And you don't have to you know, be too cynical just to walk through and say, why in the world would you think citizens voting every two years or whatever on who the mayor is when they have a choice of two candidates that are campaigning on the basis of 37 different issues? Do you really think what's going to pop out of that is the Pareto optimal amount of fireworks displays? You know what I'm saying? Like that's it's just to even say that's ridiculous. Okay, what about social insurance, which is a more general term in the U.S. We call it social security. Uh, so here, p- the, the worry is that in a free society, people are not going to provide enough for their retirement or they're not going to buy enough insurance for things like if the breadwinner dies and then there's you know, the widow or the widower, don't want to be sexist, uh, and, and taking care of the kids and whatever. And so a lot of people, certainly in the United States, think that one of the problems that came to uh, national consciousness during the 1930s. Remember during the 30s when the free market was tried and failed? That's not really what happened. Um, in the 1930s was that, oh my gosh, people just, they, they weren't providing enough. And so out of a sense of uh, paternalism, the U.S. federal government has to come in and establish what we call social security. So forcing workers to put money into this system so to then provide for them, you know, either when they retire or like if they die early and that kind of stuff that their uh, children and so forth can get these, these uh, beneficiary payments. So there's obviously a lot wrong with this besides just the, you know, the, the abstract violation of liberty. Uh, for one thing, certainly in the United States, the problem is the if you if you calculate like what's the rate of return on your retirement portfolio, you, just taking their numbers at face value, let's assume they're actually going to give you what they're promising. Uh, it's it's abysmally low compared to what you could get in alternative investments. And the, re- the primary reason for that is it's a it's a pay go system. Also, you could call it a, a Ponzi scheme, right? Where um, they're you know so the the money they're taking out of workers' paychecks, it's not that they're going out and investing them in the S and P five hundred, and they're earning a you know the, the government's got this huge portfolio earning returns that they're managing like their portfolio managers on behalf of the people who are going through their working career. No, they spend the money on other stuff. And that's where, you know, this term, the the trust fund comes from, that the treasury, it's not stealing the money. (laughs) Come on. No, it's borrowing it and it's putting IOUs there. And so the Social Security Administration is sitting on hundreds of billions, I, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head right now, of treasury bonds issued by the government. So if you were a private company and you had treasuries, that would sort of make sense that this separate institution owes you money, but when it's the government itself owing itself money, that's hardly reassuring, all right? So that's part of the, so, so the answer is, the, the specific answer is that they haven't been investing those funds on your behalf, earning interest somewhere that they can pass on to you, you know, less their management fee. They're not investing at all. They're just spending it and saying, we're going to take money from future workers' paychecks to give to you when you retire. And that's incidentally also why, these schemes are so vulnerable to demographic shifts, right? If you had a genuine 
private sector retirement where you were taking is when you were working and putting aside money in investments, you know, you're buying real estate, stocks, gold coins, whatever, and you were investing in things, then by the time you retire, it wouldn't matter if the proportion of retirees to workers shifted radically during your lifetime because the the money you would be getting in retirement as a flow of dividends from your stocks or you know, if you had bonds would be re- maturing or if you had bought, bought a bunch of life insurance or whatever, all that stuff, the reason you'd be earning that is that you were providing more capital to people making workers more productive. And that would just be your, you know, your earnings from that. And there's, there's time preference involved and so forth. But the point is it's, it's not that you would be skimming off the top of what other people were producing. Output itself would be bigger because of the capital accumulation you had contributed to during your working career as you were saving and building up your own portfolio. And so, again, it wouldn't matter whether demographics shifted or not because output would be higher precisely because of all these capital goods that you brought to the table when you were 70. So as opposed to what happens with Social Security where there is no pile stockpile of extra capital goods that can be earmarked and said, oh, this is because of all the saving this guy did during his working years. No, the government already squandered that. There is no extra capital goods. And so that's why it's a pure transfer. And so if the working age pop or the, the workers shrinks relative to the retirees, which is what's happening in the U.S., then that's why the, the pinch comes in and the finances of Social Security. Okay, uh, zoning regulations. So here... Again, people would think that in a free society, this is one of the objections I hear, that, oh my gosh, in a free society, cities would be just chaotic and there'd be pizza shops here next to nurseries, next to dentist office, next to apartment buildings, and that'd be crazy. Even, it's hard for me even to, to like state the fear properly or with, with a straight face, but that's what we, they have zoning regulations and people think that that's what you need. And so one of the things these do is separate neighborhoods into commercial versus residential, right? So they're zoned commercial or zoned residential. And that's why if you go to major cities in the United States, at least, I don't know internationally how much this is true, but you will see like the financial sector shuts down after six o'clock at night on a weekday, right? It just it turns into a ghost town, whereas the, the apartment buildings are all, you know, bustling with kids running around and stuff. But if you want to go get a pizza or something, it's, you know, you got to walk 10 blocks or whatever, right? You can't take your dry clean there. There's where people live, and then there's where businesses are. And so one of the problems of this, the, the name here is Jane Jacobs. Uh, she was a very famous author and uh, advocate of, of American cities. And so she spent a lot of her career showing how these sort of city planners were ruining cities and spawning crime and whatnot. And so on this one in particular, until you think through it, it you know, it might not even occur to you, but... That spawns crime, just that idea of zoning commercially versus residential, because originally, like when the immigrants would come into New York City and they would have a a restaurant and then live right above it, you know, the family was always right around the business. And so there's always going to be someone there watching the premises. And so as the kids are growing up, you know, the parents are going to insist that they play right there so that they can kind of keep an eye on the kids while they're running the family business. And so it's there's much more security there. It's what's called natural surveillance where there are always eyes on the premises and so on. And so unsavory types aren't going to be hanging around there because they're going to know there's always a responsible adult around and it's it's just not worth it. So someone's going to see you if you do something criminal. Whereas when these, you know, financial sectors turn into ghost towns at 6 p.m., now if you happen to be walking around there and some mugger sees you, there's nobody around to see it. Okay, so there's that element tying in with that. Jane Jacobs was also a huge opponent of the typical approach to uh, how, what we call housing projects, right? So again, you'd see these in certain areas uh, in New York City. Uh, where the heck was I? I was in Kansas City once, and I was just talking to someone on the phone, and I was walking, and the neighborhood just changed like that. And I said, I need to go. I need to keep my wits about me here. I mean, it was like the neighborhood really shifted. Like all of a sudden, you know, you've, you've realized you were not in a good neighborhood. And so in the way these things part of what's going on here, just the social dynamics. So they're low income housing, right? And that's the whole mentality. They're, they're, the, the ostensible purpose of these things is to provide affordable housing. You know, New York's really expensive place to live. And so the city government said, let's use tax dollars. We'll buy a plot of land. We'll build this, you know, big apartment unit. 
and the, the criteria to be able to live here is you have to, you can't make more than a certain amount of money, right? Because otherwise it would be subsidizing, you know, people who make a lot of money to, to live somewhere for cheap. That'd be crazy. But so then what ends up happening is there's people in these areas and then look at the design of them. And they were, I don't know what they were thinking that, you know, maybe, oh, we want to use the, the land efficiently. But the point is what ended up happening is there'd be like teenagers and stuff hanging around on the bottom talking to their friends and all of their parents would be, you know, 15 stories up and they wouldn't be able to really monitor them very well. OK, so in the terms of this compared to the original arrangement where apartments were interspersed with businesses and they're more spread out instead of these like austere command towers in terms of just keeping responsible adults near teenagers to kind of make sure nothing really crazy gets out, goes out of th that breaks down here. And so it's no wonder then that these kind of buildings, then there's all kinds of drug gangs and stuff that hang around at the bottom and they just turn into areas that are not safe at all. So it's the exact opposite. If you were trying to help people who were in a bad situation now, yeah, they have a cheap apartment perhaps, but they also live in a building that they got to walk through a bunch of drug gangs just to go home at night. Right. And so Jane Jacobs was a big uh, critic of that and was trying to show how these uh, city planners who, who were you know, patting themselves on the back for caring about these at-risk communities were actually doing things that were causing crime rates to skyrocket. And, they weren't, and, they, and she also pointed out that they weren't responsive at all to the evidence. You know, she, she was showing reams of statistics to say, look at what's happened to these communities after you come in and help them. And the, the politicians didn't care because, you know, in her explanation, they didn't really care about the results. They just wanted to have the voters think that they were doing all of these noble things. Okay, who will build the roads, right? Everyone's favorite question. So uh, here, I mean, Wal Walter Block is obviously the go-to person on this, and I think he even has a, a talk on this, and he's got books in the library or in the bookstore for this. But historically in the U.S., again, this isn't science fiction. It's not merely that we can just, as libertarian theorists, run through and say, well, hypothetically, historically there were privately provided roads. They were called turnpikes. And it's true, the rate of return on them was lower than in other ventures of comparable risk. But uh, that was, they did that because they knew that these roads would bring in certain types of business or they would facilitate commerce, all right? And so in this, I'm going to have a book here at the end and, and point it out to you guys. They They would have subscriptions, right? So they would it wasn't that you had to pay to use the road necessarily. Sometimes you did, sometimes you didn't. But the idea is they needed a bunch of upfront capital to build the road. And so they would go up and hit prominent uh, business owners or, or citizens of the community and say, hey, can you kick in for this project? And so they'd get a bunch of subscribers or shareholders to build the thing. And then it's true. They knew going into it, the rate of return on their investment wouldn't be that great. But it was either out of a sense of civ civic duty or because – you know, if they had some kind of business that relied on traffic to, to work, they, they would do that. They'd realize, OK, yeah, I'm not going to earn a lot on the road per se, but it'll help my business and so on. Or if they had something where they needed to take it to market and they were like, you know, making something in a factory or something and they needed to get to a bigger city, it would certainly be worth their while to contribute to get a good uh, thoroughfare constructed. OK, let me speed up here. We're running out of time. Utilities here. Again, the standard mainstream argument against this is they're, they're called uh, natural monopolies. And the idea is that you don't want to have 15 different companies competing to build power lines on your road. That's just a huge waste. And so they're saying in a free market, there's going to be a natural monopoly. One firm is going to do it first, and there's going to be a huge gap where they can charge what they want, monopoly prices, because for another firm to come in and then lay the same pipelines or the same power lines and whatever – it's a huge hurdle, a, a, a huge hurdle to entry. And so that's the rationale for the government granting monopolies to local companies, but then regulating their prices. All right, so a big problem with that, again, is that they don't do it the textbook way in practice. If what the utilities are saying to the regulator, what the regulators are saying to the utilities are, you can charge cost plus a little bit of return on your investment. So what happens is if they want to raise rates on electricity, they'll go to the government, show them their books and say, see, our costs have gone up such and such, you know, natural gas prices or whatever. And so we want to have a rate hike and the regulators will either sign off on it or not. Well, if what you're saying to them is we'll let you charge based on what your costs are and then a, a little markup, 
there's no incentive for them to watch their costs, right? Because they can just pass it through and there's no competition by law. All right. Another obvious flaw with this model is that think of all of the interruptions in service because prices are too low, right? In the summers, there's rolling blackouts and things like that, right? That you never see Budweiser say in the middle of July, everyone don't drink so much beer because we got to conserve, right? That's never, that's not happened. Hot dog companies don't do that, right? But publicly regulated utilities do that all the time. You know, they'll, they'll say, hey, there's a, there's a water shortage, don't water your lawn, or they'll, they'll say, set the AC higher if in an office setting, tell your employees they don't have to wear ties because we have to conserve, right? So when things are placed under the jurisdiction of state provision or a private company is given a monopoly and then regulated heavily in terms of its pricing, you get these absurd results that would be ludicrous in, if a, a, a private business were doing them. Okay, firefighting. I was going to put a picture of a bunch of firefighters with their abs and stuff, but I decided that might be a little bit inappropriate. So, sorry, ladies, you can go Google that later if you want. Um, so he... <laughs> he no judgment up here. Okay, so I like this. The, the classic example of this, and I guess got a, two more minutes here. Uh, the classic example of this guy crashes in ancient Rome. I don't know if this story is true. He was a military general. And the story is that Rome didn't have a firefighting service. It was just him. And so the, somebody's house would catch on fire. He would come up, roll up with his firefighting crew and then bargain with the owner and buy the house, you know, pennies on the dollar or whatever units on the, on the whatever their unit of currency was. And then, yeah, there you go. And then, and then put the fire out once he was the proud owner of this thing, right? And he would do it for the surrounding buildings too that were presumably at, at risk of get, get catching fire. And so that's supposed to prove how horrible it is. But what's ironic about that is that's, that's not inefficient in terms of mainstream economics, right? That's just a transfer. And so it's better that he rolled, if that story is even true, rolled up and did that as opposed to not existing at all and just letting the place burn down. Now, I think if that story is true, there clearly had to be regulations or you know, prohibitions because that would just have to happen once and everybody could see how ridiculous that was. And then why wouldn't competitors do the same thing? Or why wouldn't people make a deal with him beforehand and say, okay, for a monthly fee, if my house catches on fire, I'm not going to at that moment bargain with you. I'm just going to go ahead and, and, and pay you ahead of time to put out the fire. All right. But the point is clearly there's, there's no reason that you couldn't have private provision of fire fighting services. And again, look at what states do in practice. I was in New York City in grad school once and somebody's fire alarm went off and it was like you would think the place was under attack. There were literally 50 vehicles that rolled up and all these firefighters just walking around and it was clear because they had nothing to do, right? The thing went off and they had to, they like to drive all their cool vehicles around and they want to show it up, you know, to justify their budgets. And so the point was that, you know, there's clearly a, a, a huge response to things. So it wasn't a very good use of, of resources. Okay, let me see here. We got one more minute. Protection of wildlife. Private, private markets, right? This is the rhino. If you Google African white rhino, you'll see how private property rights were used to, this thing was ex virtually extinct in 1900. There were like 20 of them in existence on some private reserve. They brought in markets and then they, they, they flourished. Okay, later in the week, we don't have time right now, obviously, I'm going to go through judicial and law enforcement if you want to see that. It's a more esoteric topic. And then the last thing is, here's three books on these type, this one they don't have here. They have these two here. If you're interested in want the stuff that I've just touched down here, if you want to see them. So the uh, the final conclusion is that freedom is not only a good idea, but it also works. All right, thanks everybody.